Well, good morning, everybody. Thanks for uh, coming to our session. Today we're going to review uh, some uh, installations for uh, either recoveries or re-roofing and uh, using uh, more modernized material as opposed to uh, traditional roofing materials. My name is Jean Lebeau. I'm the uh, principal for MJ Building Envelope Solutions. We are the rep firm for Firestone Building Products Canada in uh, Ontario and Manitoba regions. And uh, what we do is uh, provide assistance to contractors, building owners, architects, anybody that needs uh, product support and opinions about roofing. Personally, I've been in the roofing business for uh, 30 years, and uh, I've installed them, engineered them, worked with uh, manufacturers, contractors. So I've come around the industry pretty well, full circle, and uh, always happy to help out anyone who wants uh, some assistance or has questions about roofing systems. Of course, with roof systems, uh, building owners would love to have those roofs last forever, but when it comes to uh, low slope roofing, the uh, industry average would be uh, about 25 years, depending on the type of roof system you have. And uh, designing roof systems are very, very important. Uh, we get a lot of questions when it's time to uh, do a major roof restoration on recovering uh, because the cost of a roof system can be anywhere from $6 a square foot to $35 a square foot. It's all dependent on the assembly, the, uh, the building access, the time of, of year, how much insulation you're putting into it, and so on. And uh, when it comes to roof recoveries of existing roof systems, it's, uh, there's, there's a really important question that we always ask, at least here in Ontario, is, uh, is the roof system itself going to be a standalone roof system, or is it going to be used for a platform for uh, rooftop solar, uh, vegetative roof system, and, uh, and other accessories of the sort that would create a lot of foot traffic. Uh, in many cases, if there's going to be an overburden such as rooftop solar and or vegetative roof systems, uh, this could create a significant structural uh, loading issue. So the only way to really determine if a roof can be recovered successfully is, uh, is answering the first question if it's going to be used simply for a roof system or a platform. And then a field assessment needs to take place by a roofing professional. Uh, there's a lot of roof consultants in our industry that do a great job of it if you're looking for a third-party type uh, company to inspect the roof and make recommendations. Uh, some of the basics would be a field assessment to see what the damages are, uh, see if there's any moisture. As far as detecting moisture, we always recommend a thermal scan to go and look into any thermal anomalies there may be in the roof and to confirm what the thermal anomalies are. It would require a core cut, which gives you an opportunity to see what type of insulation you have within the roof system and, uh, and to see how much uh, moisture damage insulation you may have to replace before recovering uh, the roof. So some common questions asked by, to the property managers, building owner, is uh, a history of, uh, of leaks that may have occurred on the roof system itself. And then uh, need to have a look at the height of the parapets, the height of the curbs for the mechanical equipment. Uh, as you're recovering, you're you're increasing the thickness of the roof assembly, and uh, if there's low parapets and low, low curbs for the uh, equipment up on the roof, you have to start raising all these uh, components. Sometimes the cost of a recover may not be uh, as cost effective as one might, might think. And if there's a major restoration being done on, a, uh, on the building at the same time as the roof restoration, uh, Building permits come in play, you've got to follow building code, and uh, there's many components that play into the success of a recover. In most occasions, we, we don't promote recovers. We ask uh, building owners to at least remove the existing roof membrane to be able to install additional insulation on top of the existing insulation, and that way, if the new roof membrane leaks, it's, it's not going to be trapped between two layers of roofing, which, which can 
in itself caused some pretty significant issues. So uh, for recover considerations, you would definitely want to have the right roofing professional to consult with before you proceed with, uh, with an installation because uh, you are essentially laying two membranes over each other and uh, there's also issues with uh, moving the dew point within the roof system. If the dew point is above the old roof membrane, you're going to have moisture issues and uh, the roof is going to, the insulation could decompose and uh, would have a significant impact on the life of the roof. Uh, you could uh, reduce the life of a roof as much as 50% if the recover is not done uh, properly according to the, uh, the environment the roof is going to be exposed to on that particular building. So it's not a one size fits all. Every building is different, building use will be different. So it's important to have a good detailed discussion up front about your expectations, what you want to do with that particular roof before making a decision just based on initial install cost. Um, we always have to look at the, uh, the cost of a, of a roof over the long term. Uh, if a roof only lasts 10 years as opposed to 25 years, then your annual cost would uh, be significantly different. So it's not always about the bottom line cost to recover or, or replace the roof. For re-roofing options, uh, there's a multitude of re-roofing options out there. Every contractor would uh, come up to a site. If you're inviting six contractors, you may have six different options and opinions on what would be the best roof to install on the building. Uh, again, existing conditions of a roof will definitely uh, affect what you can do. And, uh, and of course, with re-roofing, there's some parts in Ontario now. If you're going to replace an existing roof with a new roof system that's going to be heavier than what's there initially, now you're forced to get into building permits and uh, you need to do an engineering study and uh, to make sure that the structure can actually take the load of the new roof system. And of course, just like a recover, the intentions of what the roof is going to be once the new roof is installed, whether it's rooftop solar or vegetative that's going to go up on top of the membrane, uh, needs to be considered. There are many viable options out there, and uh, it's something to be conscientious of. You can get manufacturer's warranties. They're all, uh, they're all very good. The average right now is 20 years, but we're seeing warranties up to 30 years. And uh, at the end of the day, if you're adding an overburden on top of the roof system and it's not, uh, the overburden is not by the manufacturer, that overburden is not covered under the warranty. And, and quite frankly, uh, a document is not going to solve all your your issues if you have issues with the roof system. It's about having uh, the right design for the, the right application. And uh, again, it's about doing an annual cost over the life cycle of a roof to see what the best option might be. Then we get into uh, roof insulations, vapor barriers. Uh, the most common roof insulation in the roofing industry across the globe is isocyanurate foam insulation, very popular insulation. It is lightweight, uh, has, still has the best R value per inch. And uh, what we're seeing now these days, as opposed to what we we're seeing in the 80s, we're seeing two layers of insulation so that the insulation can be laid out in a staggered pattern to make sure the uh, heat loss is minimized so you don't have gaps in the insulation that uh, go directly to the steel deck. In this particular case, it's a peel and stick vapor barrier that's been installed over, directly over the steel deck, and then the insulation would be installed in two or more layers over top of the vapor barrier, fastened down, or it could be adhered uh, to that vapor barrier. There's many, many types of insulations in the industry and uh, many ways of applying them over the structural roof deck. The one thing to consider is uh, building code. We're uh, in the zone here in Canada where down in Southern Ontario, we're around zone five. And uh, for new buildings, we're seeing uh, 
much greater amounts of insulation on these uh, installations. Uh, our values of R31 are not unusual at all. And uh, as we move into regions, at least the regions we look into for uh, Northern Ontario, like Thunder Bay and Manitoba, it's not unusual to see R40 or more uh, insulation on these buildings. So depending where you fall within the, within the zone, uh, you need to, to consider what the R values are when you're putting up a new building to meet building code. Of course, uh, these uh, layers of insulations have been staggered, just like I mentioned previously, and uh, it could be in any thickness. The uh, one item to be conscientious of when you're installing multiple layers of insulation, uh, you'd like your top layer to, to be at least two inches in thickness so that you can reduce the amount of fasteners per square foot when you're installing these installations because every time you're installing a fastener and plate down to the structural deck, you're creating a breach in the vapor barrier. Uh, and depending on the vapor barrier, it could be significant uh, if it's, say, a six mil poly over a deck. Every time you penetrate that with a fastener, you're going to get air intrusion from inside the building. On windy days, you will see some membranes fluttering if it's a single ply membrane mechanically attached. So now you're introducing moisture from within the building into the roof assembly. Another thing to consider, uh, whether it's a recover or a re-roof, uh, many structures have structural slope. They're great, uh, where minimal amount of tapered insulation is required. But then we have some of these structures that are pretty well flat, and uh, water is ponding uh, and has been for years. So if you are replacing the roof, now's the time to add positive uh, slope to the roof. Uh, positive slope is part of building code, uh, so it's in your best interest to create a positive slope to the roof drains. Make sure that that water doesn't stagnate on the roof where bacteria develops and you get bacterial attack onto the membrane, and if it's an organic type membrane, they will decompose a lot faster than the membrane that is uh, on the roof that's well drained and uh, without water ponding. And of course, there's always issues with ponding water in some, uh, some small roof areas or large roof areas where uh, we'll have uh, infestation of mosquitoes and other items that can occur. And with the bacterial growth in these stagnant water ponds, uh, you're also introducing uh, some of that into, uh, into the HVAC system as the air intakes are simply taken on the air uh, that's coming off the roof. So having a good tapered system is uh, well worth the investment. Uh, and if you are installing a tapered insulation, you wanna make sure you have a base layer onto it so that you're breaking all the uh, insulation joints so you don't have that thermal ridging going on uh, between the insulation joints. And these uh, layouts, although they look quite complex sometimes, they're, uh, they're quite easy for, uh, to come up with for an experienced uh, manufacturer. Like Firestone has a, a team, that's all they do. We send them roof plans. They come up with the best possible uh, tapered insulation layout, make sure it's effective and that uh, it's, it's cost efficient also. So. Uh, to get this tapered insulation, it's not very complicated. As long as we have uh, a roof sketch and or, or roof plans, it's easy to uh, create these tapered insulation layouts. Now we get into cover boards. Uh, cover boards were used uh, in conventional roof assemblies all the time. So if you're doing a four ply built up system, you would always have uh, a fiber board on top of the isocyanurate insulation. Uh, it serves a dual purpose. You can't put hot asphalt over top of, uh, over top of the uh, isocyanurate foam by mopping a membrane directly into it because it will cause ridging of the membrane and, and the membrane will fail prematurely. So you would have a wood fiber board typically installed over the iso foam and uh, it would also act as a diffusion layer with uh, moisture within the roof system itself. 
uh, the moisture can then uh, migrate through the fiberboard as opposed to pushing up and causing blisters and ridging on the membrane itself. Uh, some of these boards are, can be very heavy, hard to handle, and you have to be careful with some of the cover boards that may or may not be compatible with every roofing membrane available in the industry. And now we're seeing uh, a change with some of these cover boards, especially in the single ply market, where uh, new technologies have allowed to uh, develop these uh, cover boards. They're extremely lightweight uh, and uh, are glass coated facers. They are uh, mold resistance. They have a good uh, fire resistance and they actually contribute to the overall R value of the roof system. Uh, if you were to compare some of these boards, you would see that uh, the first one, high density polyisos, which are the new generation cover boards, uh, do provide uh, some additional R value and compared to a glass reinforced uh, gypsum board. So it's the difference between uh, a sheet, a four by eight sheet that weighs 11 pounds versus a half inch uh, glass reinforced gypsum board that weighs 64 pounds. Uh, so it's a whole different uh, way of installing the roof and uh, it also adds to structural loading. Wood fiberboard is still very uh, well used in uh, the built up industry. The single ply manufacturers have uh, all pretty well done away with uh, fiberboards uh, because of uh, some of the issues if uh, fiberboard gets wet, it does uh, decompose and uh, it's, uh, it's not a great thing if you have a membrane, a single ply membrane fully adhered to it and it gets wet, then it's gonna delaminate and uh, cause a blow off and uh, nobody needs that on these uh, long-term warranties. So uh, these lightweight boards definitely uh, have good compatibility with most construction materials out there they're not like uh, the styrenes, where styrenes would simply melt at low temperatures. The uh, isocyanurate foam insulations or high density foam insulations, even in a fire, would uh, turn into charcoal, so they, they don't melt and, and uh, promote flame spread. The most common thickness of uh, high density polyisos is half an inch. There is, uh, I believe, one manufacturer who has a quarter inch uh, board in, uh, in high density, but most manufacturers have a half inch board. And even within those uh, high density polyiso boards, there are different compression strengths. Uh, it can range anywhere from 90 uh, PSF all the way up to 120 PSF. So there are some variances in those boards, but they're all lightweight. So when we're looking at uh, our value, uh, a half inch high density board would have an R2.5, uh, which is great. Uh, while with a glass reinforced uh, gypsum board, there is, uh, there is hardly any R value to be considered there. And same with, with fiber board, it's not, not much of an R value there. So if you're combining polyisocyanurate foam insulation with uh, high density polyiso boards, cover boards, uh, along with uh, single ply membranes, you're, uh, you're creating a very lightweight roof system. So you're going from a roof system that would weigh anywhere from eight to 12 pounds a square foot, say the traditional built up roof system, to a roof system that's gonna be anywhere from two and a half to three pounds a square foot. So if you're looking at uh, changing the purpose of your roof, having a roof uh, on an existing structure to all of a sudden house a rooftop solar array, then you need to create structural capacity to be able to, uh, to house a rooftop PV solar without having to reinforce the structure itself. So uh, if you can create four or five pounds of extra structural capacity by using one of those systems, then you may be able to uh, have a success successful project when you're installing uh, other components above your roof system. Single ply membranes are definitely very adaptable to just about any surface. They're not, uh, it's, again, with roofing membranes, it's not a one size fits all. If you have a roof that's got uh, significant roof traffic and that, 
you really need to look at all the roofing membrane options because if you don't have the right roofing membrane, it's going to get damaged relatively quickly. Then you're going to suffer leaks and uh, the roof uh, performance is going to be uh, going to be short lived. So picking the right membranes or assembly altogether is is critical. So uh, like I was saying, uh, there's really two major types of uh, single ply roofing membranes in the industry. You have the thermal set uh, membranes, which are EPDM rubber membranes. They could be uh, reinforced or non-reinforced and would, be, uh, would come in a variety of sizes. And the gauge would, would vary from a 45 gauge all the way up to, a, to uh, like a 90 mil membrane, which is extremely thick. And, uh, and then there's thermoplastics. And thermoplastics, the predominant thermoplastic in North America and, and around the world right now is, is TPO membrane. There seems to be a, a craze of installation everywhere, billions of square feet uh, around the world. And uh, it's a great option. They're always light colored membranes. They're either white or, uh, or tan color or light gray color. And uh, across North America, what we're seeing is uh, reflective membranes and and the lion's share of TPO membranes installed these days are, are white to meet uh, s the solar reflective index that is required. And the one thing with thermoplastic membranes, they're always reinforced. Back in late 70s, mid to late 70s, uh, they first introduced thermoplastic membranes in the roofing market. They were unreinforced and uh, there was some very severe uh, catastrophes with some of these roofs uh, as thermoplastics really need to be reinforced to be able to perform in, in the environment out there. While EPDM rubber membranes are, uh, are very flexible even in low temperatures all the way down to minus 50. So they, it is a, a membrane that can go to extreme heat and extreme cold and still maintain great physical properties to make sure that it stays intact. Here is an example of a thermoplastic membrane. In this case, it's a TPO membrane being installed uh, in a mechanically fastened system. This is a, an example of a traditional inseam mechanically attached uh, system. And uh, as you will see as we go on, there, these systems have now developed to the next uh, generation. And uh, these TPO membranes are very uh, UV stable. They certainly uh, have a great qualities as far as uh, weathering and all that. And they, they've been tested uh, under uh, severe uh, testing conditions to make sure that they can uh, perform in the long term, whether it's in the hot environment or cold environment. And uh, they're very flexible. So they can be mechanically attached or fully adhered. We don't see uh, loosely ballasted TPO membranes uh, very often at all. It's less than 3% of the market. Why have a white membrane and then put gravel over it? And you might as well use uh, a membrane such as EPDM to install the, that particular system. So if uh, you're looking for a roof system with uh, no thermal ridging uh, through the fasteners all the way to the underside of the membrane, you have many options uh, once you have installed a vapor barrier over your, uh, over your structural deck, whether it's wood or steel or concrete, uh, you could still uh, install a variety of vapor barriers. You have an option of either adhering all the insulation and membrane or mechanically attaching, say, the first layer of insulation, then adhering uh, secondary layers with uh, a two-part foam adhesive, and then adhering the membrane to a cover board. Here we see uh, another example of a thermoplastic membrane. This is a membrane that is uh, available in the US. It's uh, the new next generation coming to uh, North America with uh, peel and stick single ply membranes. Uh, it definitely takes a lot of mystery out of the equation. It's not about uh, applying uh, adhesive uh, quantities to both surfaces and then gluing the membrane. It's a simple release film and it gets uh, adhered to the, uh, to the substrate. Uh, with thermoplastics, like I said, there's uh, several types of uh, thermoplastics. PVCs are the only uh, thermoplastic membranes that need uh, plasticizers to keep them flexible. 
if uh, you were to expose a PVC membrane to a, a substrate or an environment on the roof that's not compatible with the roof membrane, then you can have plasticizer migration and then the membrane uh, becomes very rigid and would go through glass transition at uh, temperatures even to 5 degrees Celsius where you can actually fracture the membrane if the plasticizers have migrated out of the membrane. So uh, that's not an issue with uh, thermoplastic membranes, uh, with TPO membranes, but uh, PVC is definitely a very different membrane than, than TPO, even though if you look at them visually, they both look the same. PVCs and TPOs, uh, there's uh, definitely a couple different kinds. There's the PVC membranes that have been the longest thermoplastic membrane in the industry. Uh, they, uh, they started the installations of those membranes in the 60s and uh, right up to today, they still uh, exist in the marketplace. And then there's uh, PVC blended membranes, the key membranes that are, uh, that are a mixture of, uh, of other rock components, which uh, could bring some qualities to, uh, to a roof system. Typically, key membranes will be used in uh, environments where restaurants, where there's going to be grease contamination from the exhaust fans and that, because they, they have better abilities to resist the grease contamination than PVC. And, uh, and then TPO is definitely a very, uh, a very resistant membrane. It can resist, resist grease to a certain extent. But the fact that these membranes are, are a smooth surface, it's easy to uh, clean these membranes with uh, a soap and brush and rinse it off to make sure that grease contamination doesn't accumulate on the roof and destroy the membranes. So definitely when it comes to uh, thermoplastic membranes, there's PVC and there's TPO. There's not uh, many other types out there in the roofing industry. With TPO membranes, uh, there are quite a number of manufacturers in North America. Uh, and there's also uh, resellers, uh, like any other market, whether it's automotive or any other construction products, there's a certain number of manufacturers and then there's uh, certain companies that would uh, purchase the material under private label and resell it as their own. And uh, although TPO membranes will all look the same, it's important to look at the, uh, the technical data related to uh, the product to see what type of testing it has, where the membrane is originating from, and uh, you know, how long has that manufacturer been in business? We see manufacturers that will offer a 30-year warranty, but they've been in business for two years. It's like getting a lifetime warranty on many of the things that we buy every day. It, it creates the attraction, oh, it's got a lifetime warranty, but uh, if the company's not around in a couple years, then that lifetime warranty means nothing. Uh, so it's all about assessing the product and the manufacturers offering the product to make sure that you're, you're dealing with uh, a, a good manufacturer that's got long history in the roofing industry so that if you do have issues that crop up on your roof system you're not left uh, you're not left alone to deal with these issues uh, you, you get the full support of these manufacturers and the most important thing whether it's a TPO or a thermoplastic is the uh, thickness over the reinforcement over the scrim uh, there is uh, standards minimum standards that manufacturers need to meet to make sure that there's, uh, there's enough thickness over the scrim because if you get scuffs in the membrane, foot traffic, whatever not, some abuse, uh, and the, th the top layer of thermoplastic has been abraded off the uh, reinforcement, then it can uh, introduce moisture that will wick into between the membrane layers itself and cause premature failure. And in some cases, the underside of these single ply membranes may not be UV stable. So if the top layer is removed and the bottom layer is not UV stable, most of the time within two to four years, there will be a total breakdown of the under layer, allowing moisture uh, through the roof system itself. So this is an example of uh, thickness over scrim. Uh, Although it's 
when you look at it with, at the, with the naked eye, it doesn't seem like much, but uh, every bit matters. The one on the upper left shows uh, very little over scrim, so if you were to get uh, foot traffic and some, some abuse, it would be very easy to, uh, to expose the reinforcement. And once that reinforcement is, is exposed to the elements, then moisture can travel through the reinforcement itself and then cause delamination between the two uh, laminated films. When you look at the, uh, the bottom right hand corner, you have uh, plenty of uh, membrane over scrim. So that way, uh, on the day to day uh, scuffs that will occur on the roof, you're not going to expose that, that reinforcement and cause premature failure because of it. Another item to uh, take note is uh, single ply membranes. TPO membranes have been uh, changing tremendously in the past few years, uh, past five years really. Uh, these white reflective TPO membranes were installed, rooftop solar systems, and what happened with the old testing methods, they realized that TPO membranes or thermoplastic membranes were failing because of premature heat aging. So now uh, there's a new uh, ASTM standard to test TPO membranes to uh, higher temperatures and to, uh, to longer exposure. So now the minimum is 224 days under these laboratory conditions to make sure that the membrane doesn't prematurely age. Uh, although there's many other membranes that get uh, utilized, such as modified bitumens, built-up roof systems, uh, there's likely going to be some additional testing with other membranes to make sure that they don't fail prematurely because uh, you're elevating the uh, temperature of the roof membrane by adding these uh, overburdens onto a roof system. So TPO membranes definitely have been uh, tested to withstand those uh, conditions. When it gets to uh, Firestone, they have the brand name Ultraply TPO. They come in 45, 60, 80 mil thicknesses and uh, up to 12 foot wide uh, rolls. The rolls can be as long as 200 feet long, but the bigger the roll, the tougher it is for the guys uh, to, to install on the roof because it's there's a lot more weight to it. But you can get uh, a 30 year full system warranty on the 80 mil membranes. It's common with uh, TPO membrane manufacturers to uh, extend up to a 30 year. Again, white, gray, or tan, never a, uh, a dark color because if it was a dark color, the membrane itself would age and fail prematurely because of uh, thermal movement. Along with these systems is uh, all the pre-manufactured penetration details such as the molded pipe boots and corners. Uh, in the 70s, 80s, a lot of these roofs were installed with uh, just a membrane. There was no pre-manufactured uh, boots or corners. It was left up to the, uh, the journeyman roofer on site to manufacture these things. And uh, what's been happening in the last 10 years, uh, like many other trades, it's hard to find uh, the younger generation. You know, there's not too many 20-year-olds that wake up one morning and say, I want to be a roofer. Uh, it's, it's more and more difficult to find that kind of uh, skill set in the industry. So the manufacturers have responded with these pre-manufactured penetration flashings to make sure that it's not left up to the imagination of a, uh, of a journeyman roofer on site uh, to install these. They're pre-manufactured in a controlled environment. That way you can uh, have better quality and the reason why manufacturers can offer these extended warranties all the way up to 30 years. So the accessories are much greater than what we're, what we're seeing here. There are accessories for every installation and uh, every year manufacturers come up with new and improved uh, penetration uh, materials that are manufactured in the, in the manufacturing environment as opposed to the roof itself. Here we're seeing uh, a traditional installation of a mechanically attached thermoplastic membrane. Uh, this is the first generation mechanically attached membrane where it gets fastened in the seam. 
as you see in the upper left photo, then the adjacent roll would uh, lap over uh, that membrane by approximately six inches so that there's a salvage edge to be uh, welded with a uh, hot air uh, robotic welder or, or hand welder. And uh, they're very popular. Uh, they're still popular to this day, but now we're, we're seeing some uh, changes because of uh, FM testing and some of the changes to FM where the sheets have to be no more than eight feet wide as opposed to a 12 foot wide uh, sheet when they're installed in an inseam system. So now we're seeing these, this new generation uh, mechanically attached systems that are uh, done through induction welding. So you see all the plates on these uh, insulation boards. These plates are epoxy coated and uh, they act as fixation for the insulation and the roofing membrane once uh, the induction welder has, uh, has been completed. And you can see in the bottom left photos, uh, induction welder would take six to eight seconds, up to 10 seconds to warm up the plate, melt the backside of the membrane onto the epoxy coated plate. And then a magnetic, uh, magnetic pole is installed immediately over the plate uh, over the membrane to make sure that the membrane is 100% contact with the plate and it also help with the cooling process where the heat is drawn through uh, the magnetic uh, pole to make sure that it cools off uh, rapidly. These systems have been in place for more than five years now. There are billions of square feet of this system installed and there's a lot of merit to this new uh, non-penetrating mechanically attached system. Uh, they uh, they definitely offer the contractor a lot more flexibility um, as far as completing the roof to get in a watertight, but it also uh, helps to spread the wind load where traditional sheets up to 12 feet wide with air intrusion from the underside would flutter. And uh, on some buildings, it makes no difference, but if you're in a library and you have a single ply thermoplastic membrane fluttering as it hits the insulation and that it could get quite noisy in the building. Uh, so sometimes with air intrusion, the traditional mechanically attached system can create some other environmental issues inside the building that uh, are not uh, wanted. Here's an example of uh, induction welded system. As you can see in this case, there's a, there's a plate welded to the backside of the membrane at every two foot interval. So if you have a lot of air infiltration from within the building itself, it helps to distribute the load a lot more evenly onto the roofing membrane. And you have a lot of less instances of membrane fluttering and causing noises inside the building. Uh, although not all contractors install these uh, systems at this point, uh, we're finding that the lion's share of contractors now have that the induction welder equipment to be able to, uh, to install these systems. And from a warranty standpoint, with the extended manufacturer's warranties, these uh, systems can qualify for the same warranties as the traditionally uh, installed mechanically attached system. Then we uh, get into fully adhered uh, TPO or thermoplastic membranes. They can be fully adhered also, uh, whether it's new construction or re-roofing, uh, still can be done very successfully. And there's also some thermoplastic membranes with uh, fleece backing onto it. We don't see as many of those membranes, but uh, at times we have some building owners and or uh, roof consultants that want uh, a fleece on the back of the membrane so that it can be installed with asphalt. Of course, we're dealing with black asphalt, white membrane. It can be challenging to, uh, for a contractor to keep it clean on site but it could be uh, a great option for, for a recover situation where you have a roof that's in really good shape. You don't want to introduce an open flame application membrane to renew the roofing membrane where you have the option of installing uh, a, a membrane set with the fleece on the back of it with asphalt and that's a fully warrantable roof system, which can be installed with adhesive as in the bottom right hand side corner uh, there are adhesives for those membranes that could be used, traditional uh, solvent or solvent-free uh, bonding adhesives that can be used. 
They can also be used with uh, low-rise uh, foam adhesives, which are very similar to the two-part low-rise foam adhesives that would be used to uh, adhere insulation boards or, or cover boards. Uh, it, the components themselves are very, very similar, where you could do a uh, ribbon adhesive application and roll the uh, membrane into it, and you would have a partially fully adhered uh, membrane, which can meet uh, win up low requirements and, and be warranted uh, by the manufacturers. Here's a close-up view of uh, an installation of a thermoplastic membrane with uh, with the fleece on the back of it in a low-rise foam. Although it's a fast system to utilize, you'll see uh, as the foam rises in the beads, uh, some of those anomalies are going to telegraph through the membrane itself. Uh, so, of course, they need to be rolled and, and that once installed, but uh, it could create some, uh, some waves in the membrane uh, after it's installed as opposed to a traditional uh, bonding adhesive that would be used over uh, an insulation or a cover board. So, some of the key takeaways for TPO thermoplastic membranes are certainly a very uh, good choice in the industry, in the construction industry. They're lightweight, they're energy efficient, if that's what uh, you're looking for. And uh, the, the word of caution would be research the manufacturers uh, very well ahead of time. Uh, there's a lot of manufacturers that uh, are out there and it's really hard to decipher at times who's a good manufacturer and maybe who's not such a great manufacturer. It's, it's about it's about a manufacturer that's going to take care of problems if problems arise. It's two, three, five, ten years down the road. Uh, if you have a problem, you want a manufacturer that's going to look after you because otherwise, if uh, you don't have that manufacturer there, you may have to replace the roof at your own cost where that warranty document it ain't going to help you if that manufacturer is not around. So, Utilizing uh, manufacturers like Firestone that have been in business for more than 30 years is, is a good place to start. Now we're going to get into EPDM membranes. Uh, they're widely used. Uh, Firestone itself this year is celebrating 35th year anniversary with EPDM membranes. So at least 35 years here in Canada. It's a thermoset uh, product and uh, is available in various thicknesses uh, all the way up to 90 mil. And EPDM membranes were introduced in the 80s in Canada. And we, that's when we saw a lot of big box retailers and warehouses uh, where these systems were loose laid and ballasted and very fast to install. And uh, in those days, 45 mil membranes were very, very prominent in the single ply industry. While at, in today's uh, industry, we're seeing 60 mil as the, uh, as the average thickness of the membrane being used. Uh, we would say approximately 80% of the market would use a minimum of 60 mil membrane. And now we're seeing thicker membranes like uh, 90 mil EPDM membranes or 80 mil thermoplastic membranes being used more and more every single day. Um, I personally look at single ply membranes as uh, you, know, you can design them for a long, sustainable performing roof system as opposed to what was the concept in the 70s and the 80s was that, okay, single ply membrane is, is a cheap option. It doesn't have to be a cheap option. It could be a long performing roof, a very sustainable uh, roof system if you're getting into uh, membranes that are thicker and installed over uh, high density polyiso cover boards, for instance, for better puncture resistance. There's many ways to, uh, to make these uh, single ply roof systems perform a lot longer than what the initial introduction into the market was to recover everything, recover all these built up roofs and, uh, and don't worry, it'll dry in July. Well, there's been some very major uh, issues with some of these installations where now single ply manufacturers are all on the same page and promoting roof systems with single ply membranes they are going to last uh, a lot longer. Hence the reason they're offering 30 year warranties. Uh, 30 year system warranty is, is serious business. Uh, while maybe in the 70s and, and uh, early 80s, we're seeing five year warranties or 10 year warranties. And once you get into these 30 year systems, 
uh, the manufacturers want to make sure that they're going to outperform these warranties because if they wouldn't, then nobody in the manufacturing sector would be in business. So EPDM membranes, like I said, they're reinforced or unreinforced. They're available in either the traditional black color or with the white uh, finish. We're uh, seeing more and more white EPDM membranes uh, in the roofing industry. Some uh, building owners and or architects and, and consultant specifiers like the physical qualities of EPDM membranes, but they also want that reflective uh, quality. So uh, we have the option of offering these uh, white EPDM membranes. They are very versatile membranes. They could be installed in any way uh, imaginable. It could be loose ballasted, such as the first uh, one on the left. It could be a mechanically attached system or fully adhered. The best performers uh, in, uh, in EPDM membranes are fully adhered membranes. There's no air infiltrating from within the building. There's no, you're not introducing moisture from within the building into the roof system and uh, definitely uh, best performing system that uh, money can buy. And it's still a very competitive and cost effective approach. Here we're seeing a fully adhered system going, uh, going down over top of uh, insulation. These membranes are easy to install. Bonding adhesives can be installed with uh, spray equipment, the traditional paint roller, or uh, pressure, uh, a pressurized uh, applicator machine, or with simply uh, what they call a better spreader. They grab the cans of uh, bonding adhesive put it on the, uh, on the spreader, punch holes into it, and then uh, roll the uh, adhesives onto large surfaces. There, there are challenges with, when dealing with adhesives. They're uh, weather sensitive. Uh, so if it's minus 20, it's going to be challenging to, to adhere a membrane. Uh, but in the uh, good uh, weather, say uh, minus 5 and rising, you can use uh, some of these uh, adhesives very successfully. The most versatile adhesive is uh, solvent based but uh, as our world of construction is changing we're seeing a big move to eliminating as many solvents as possible in the construction industry so manufacturers are, uh, are responding uh, to these demands with, uh, with some other types of adhesives. So here we can see some examples of uh, traditional uh, membranes and the white EPDM membrane. You will see uh, if you ever have a contractor install a white EPDM rubber membrane onto your building, the top of the membrane is white and the lower part of the membrane is black. So it is two uh, films that are vulcanized, laminated together and uh, installed with the, uh, with the black portion uh, towards the insulation or cover board. Um, and these, these dark colored membranes are great in, uh, in northern climates. So if you're fully adhering a membrane, EPDM membrane, and the backside of it is black, even if it's like minus 10 outside, the membrane itself is not going to be at that temperature. It's going to be at a much higher temperature because if the sun is, is hitting the uh, backside of the membrane, it's going to help to warm it up. So there's a lot of benefits in having that... Uh, that uh, dark colored backing onto it. And uh, as far as heating and cooling, uh, it really doesn't matter as much. It's the uh, heating and cooling of the building. The most critical part is the insulation and not necessarily the color of the roofing membrane. What is your definition of the line? Uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's a very wavy line. Uh, in uh, in climates where it's it's going to go below uh, freezing point, there uh, there could be some advantages with uh, say a co uh, dark colored roof like this, uh, where the, in winter a lot of them are covered, but it would help to promote melting and uh, and clearing off the roof faster of the snow if it's a dark color. Uh, the, what matters as far as the interior of the building is how much insulation is in there. So the membrane itself 
we see a lot of studies with, uh, with dark colored roofs and light colored roofs and heating and cooling savings. Uh, at the end of the day, it's the insulation should be the one providing the, uh, the heating or, or cooling savings, not the membrane itself. This is, uh, this is a plant uh, here in Ontario, it's Honda, and uh, it was all uh, EPDM membranes. Uh, they've had a lot of success with those installations. So it just goes to show that it doesn't have to be small. It can also be a large project uh, with reinforced or unreinforced EPDM, and it will work uh, very good if installed properly. The, uh, for fully deared membranes, uh, manufacturers now have pre-taped uh, seams where the tape itself is not applied in the field. It's applied at the factory and we're seeing a uh, gain in popularity with, amongst contractors to have these pre-taped membranes for fully deared systems because there's less chances of human error and uh, it's actually much faster for the installation of the roof system if uh, you don't need uh, a roofer on his hands and knees to install uh, the seam tape onto the membrane itself. So it makes the process a lot simpler. Here we could see uh, another application with uh, st standard uh, bonding adhesive, but there's also water-based bonding adhesives that are available, uh, low VOC adhesives that are, uh, that are uh, required and uh, to meet lead and other factors to reduce the amounts of solvents. So uh, LVOC adhesives, of course, tend to be more expensive because the raw components are, are much different than solvent-based. But as the world shifts away from solvents, it creates more demand in uh, low VOC products. And as that volume grows, it's going to help to bring that cost in line too. Here's another uh, example of uh, Adhesives. And the one thing to note that are that is very important. Not every manufacturer's adhesives will work with another manufacturer's membrane. Uh, we get a lot of calls every day. So can I use this adhesive for that membrane? And we say no, and that's just within Firestone. They have specific adhesives for specific membranes and applications. But uh, not all these adhesives are the same for every manufacturer. So the uh, traditional uh, EPDM bonding adhesive, solvent-based bonding adhesive, it's been around for quite a long time uh, since the introduction of, of EPDM membranes here in Canada. And now uh, what we're seeing is uh, next generation uh, bonding adhesives that are solvent-free and uh, only required to be installed over the substrate and the membrane can then be rolled into it while it's wet because there's no solvents flashing off so it's not going to cause blistering of the membrane. So this is uh, next generation adhesives that have been introduced in the past few years. They've all passed testing to meet uh, all the different ASDM requirements, FM, ULC. Uh, so now we're getting into uh, bonding adhesives that can be used uh, inside a building with no impact whatsoever to uh, the occupants of the building. Because uh, solvent-free adhesives tend to have quite an odor and uh, not great for occupied buildings. Here we can see a uh, solvent-free adhesive being installed. It could be done on, uh, on the horizontal or vertical application. The important thing to keep in mind is these, this adhesive needs to be installed in temperatures 4 degrees and rising. Uh, but it has a lot of great qualities to it. No mixing. Usually you always have to prompt some of the contractors, make sure you mix your adhesives in that. And uh, this adhesive, no mixing. Uh, gets installed only on one surface and the membrane gets rolled into it wet so there's no more guys standing around watching glue dry while the roof is being installed so again it's a faster application and a great product when you're dealing with occupied buildings so you don't have to worry about solvents getting into the uh, into the system air system and uh, bringing that product inside the building itself so uh, instead of going with LVOC adhesives, then why not solvent-free adhesives if the project is scheduled to be in, in weather that's going to be, on average, uh, more than 4 degrees uh, Celsius. So these uh, solvent-free bonding adhesives would have uh, 
a lot greater coverage in the traditional solvent base. So you're going from an average of 50 uh, square feet per gallon to 150 square feet per gallon. So uh, the product does carry uh, a lot further and it's available to all the roofing contractors uh, across North America and beyond. Now we're going to get into the details, uh, into the seaming of EPDM membranes. Uh, seaming of EPDM membranes has changed a lot over the last few decades. It started with simply with cleaning the EPDM membrane, applying adhesives, while now we're, we're seeing uh, priming of the uh, surface and tapes. All EPDM membranes now are installed with tapes for all the seams and uh, and that penetrations. So the uh, the installation is pretty simple. Uh, measure where the seam is going to be. The primer itself is applied with a scrub pad, not a roller or paintbrush. The scrub pad is very abrasive and it, it abrades the top of the roof membrane uh, with the priming uh, substance to make sure that the tape gets uh, well embedded into the uh, membrane itself. Then the Seam tape is applied. Here in this photo you can see it's a, it's a wax paper being used. Uh, some of these uh, tapes are, uh, also come with the uh, plastic film onto them. Some prefer paper, some prefer the plastic film. It's, uh, it's always personal preference. The tape itself would, uh, would go beyond the seam approximately a quarter inch and uh, just to make sure that the edge of the seam is not left uh, open. And then these things would be a uh, roller, uh, use a roller to, uh, to put them in place. The rollers in this particular case are just a small hand roller, but there is rolling equipment available out there where uh, it's very similar to a floor polisher, except for instead of a pad, it's got all the wheels underneath there. So you can use a mechanical roller to roll the seams and the membrane in place. Uh, here's uh, just the most important thing of seaming is obviously making sure it's clean, no moisture, free of debris, rolled together the way it should be. Uh, and uh, manufacturers, all the single ply manufacturers require these contractors to come in for not just a classroom setting training, but also hands-on training. And uh, there's a licensing process to, uh, for the contractors to, uh, to go through to make sure that they're installing the roof systems correctly. Here, uh, in this particular case, we call them uh, quick seam products because they're quick to install, primer, and then stick the product on and roll it in place, and, uh, and you're done. So it could be installed very, very efficiently. There's all types of different products available for every instance of application, whether it's uh, a detail, seams, whatever the case might be. Manuf manufacturers have a great variety of uh, detailing products available. Here we can see complementary products that are uh, that are available, not just uh, pre-manufactured boots and our fasteners and bars. We also have pre-manufactured metal edges. If you uh, get into a 30-year system warranty, most manufacturers are going to want uh, the contractor to install a pre-engineered metal edge system because that's when that's where most of the wind is going to impact onto the building and that's where most roof blow-offs start occurring is at the edge and then it just progresses across the roof. So uh, for these extended 30-year warranties, it wouldn't be unusual to, uh, to see these engineered metal edge system installed. They're all tested and uh, the manufacturers of these engineered metal edge systems need to be certified and uh, there's not one contractor in Canada that is certified to manufacture um, these pre-engineered uh, metal edge systems. So if somebody says they are, they're not. Uh, always welcome to call me to, to confirm because things change all the time, but uh, contractors themselves that I'm aware of are not certified to, uh, to manufacture these. Here we can see some more complementary products, whether it's a, a, a pipe boot or penetration boot or target patches or fasteners, uh, cleaners, primers, adhesives, or, uh, or even coatings uh, to be installed over it. 
manufacturers like Firestone have everything available that a contractor could ever possibly need on the site to uh, make sure that he can install to, uh, to the site requirements. For the curbs, typically the same roofing membrane will be used to wrap the curbs. And for all the corner details, uh, manufacturers like Firestone have uh, pre-manufactured corners uh, to make sure that uh, everything can be uh, flashed in with the same roofing mem as the roofing membrane itself and to, uh, to be just continuous. Uh, in many cases, there would be a perimeter reinforcement or secure mem membrane used. In the 80s, everything was installed with a termination bar at the edges of the roof, and then another piece of membrane would overlap over the roofing membrane. Now, with the Quickseam products, there's a reinforced, what we call an RPF strip, uh, is installed. It's a reinforced CPDM membrane with fasteners and plates and there's a pressure sensitive tape onto it where the membrane can be simply primed and rolled into that strip so you don't have to cut the membrane anymore. You could simply continue with your membrane up and over the parapet and still have that perimeter securement. To This eliminates a lot of cutting and a lot of seaming. The less seams on the roof, the better. Uh, you know, we're, We see products out there where you're gonna have a seam every three feet or a little bit less all the way up to 12 feet, or if it's uh, EPDM, it could be, uh, EPDM membranes can be as wide as, as 50 feet wide and could be as long as 200 feet long. So uh, why get a, a membrane that size if you gotta start cutting it everywhere and introducing seams? So manufacturers like Firestone have all these accessories to minimize the amount of seams required when you're doing all these details. So for EPDM membranes, it's definitely been around for a long time. Like I said, Firestone celebrating its 35th year, so uh, 35 years of track record is something to be said. Of course, uh, if you were to compare that to uh, the bituminous world that's been around for centuries, single plies certainly don't have a 300-year track record, but uh, to have a track record over 30 years, if, uh, if you do some... Uh, investigating uh, around the world, you'll see that, that these are proven uh, membranes and definitely can, uh, can perform uh, extremely well. EPM membranes were originally introduced as uh, liner membranes for, uh, for geo applications and uh, some of these applications are now 40 plus years old and are still performing as, uh, as pond liners. So EPM membranes definitely have a, a long track record. And uh, all these warranties, uh, up to 30 years, so it's gotta be a good uh, performing membrane for a manufacturer to, to offer a warranty that long. And uh, EPDM rubber is very, very easy to recycle. Uh, if you were to look it up, you would find more than 100 uh, rubber recyclers across Canada. Uh, where in thermoplastic membranes, it's a little more difficult to find uh, recycling programs for them. But with EPDM, it's, it's very, very easy to find uh, recyclers. It would simply take the membrane, uh, process it, make a crumble rubber out of it. And everywhere we turn now, whether it's children's playgrounds or all kinds of, uh, of accessory equipment available, crumble rubber is, uh, is utilized in many, many different applications. So EPDM is definitely always uh, very easy to, uh, to recycle. So keep in mind, uh, you know, dark roof versus uh, light colored roof, uh, both of them can be energy efficient. If you look at most studies that are being done with uh, light colored roofs or dark colored roofs, uh, I always ask the question every time, do you take snow coverage into account because it does snow quite a bit in Canada and, and uh, these roofs are sometimes covered all winter so even if the membrane is black it's still going to be white when it's covered by snow and most of these studies don't take into account uh, the snow coverage that we face here in Canada because a lot of these things are done in southern US uh, 
in hot parts of that country where they could have a lot, a lot more impact on, on the building. The insulation uh, obviously is a very expensive component of a roof system. Uh, but at the end of the day, the, the savings is, uh, is not always achieved through the membrane. The, the most efficient way of achieving savings and energy efficiency is through insulation because that's the insulation is there. It's a constant 24-7. It's not relying on sun or anything to do its job. So uh, that's why we're seeing uh, a lot more insulation being used.